So without further ado, I will pass over to Neil Jacobs, uh, who will be facilitating this meeting. Hi, thank you, Will. Welcome, everyone. Uh, very pleased to be here. Such a good turnout. Um, not entirely surprised, I suppose. It, the word indicators and the words open research are perhaps uh, things that we're all paying attention to for all sorts of very good reasons. Um, and I'm really pleased that I've got a range of speakers to talk uh, today about some of the really exciting work we're doing to explore how we might uh, do better at uh, monitoring open research. So I'm going to say a few words to start with. In fact, what I'm going to do, and I don't think this is going to be death by PowerPoint, because I think I'm one of the relatively few people who's using PowerPoint. Um, but let me share my screen. Um, so there we go. That's that's what I hope we will uh, get through today. So a pretty packed schedule. Um, and you can see a whole range of different sort of topics in open research that we're going to be able to focus on. Um, and we're going to start with a, a little overview from me uh, and then move on to look at a set of pilot projects that we have uh, running or just starting at the moment, um, being led by um, these people. Uh, I'm hoping they're all here. They weren't all here when we kicked the meeting off, but I'm hoping all of these speakers are here now. I'm sure they are. And uh, wrapping up with a, a, a short talk from uh, Lydia's, Lydia Wheeler, who is a master student that's working with me on some sort of more strategic thinking and research around what the characteristics of indicators might usefully be and the sorts of things that we might look for in those characteristics. So without further ado, um, sorry, just to say there's a little time at the end for questions. Um, but if it's at all possible, uh, we'll do a little bit of a question and answer after each of these sessions. Um, so if there's time, we will we will run that way. So keep your questions ready, and um, we'll hope to cover them as we as we step through. So a little bit of background as to why I'm interested in open research indicators. I run the UKRN's Open Research Programme. And that's doing a number of things. Uh, it's got 24 partners across the United Kingdom in, who are institutions, and we're building skills through a training program. We're trying to revise the ways in which institutions recruit and promote staff, so the incentive structure through the OR4 program. And you might have seen a working paper that came out this week about that. Um, and we're doing that partly to improve efficiency in, in ways that improve efficiency by enabling institutions to share good practice and not reinvent the wheel, but also to look at the sustainability of our whole, whole effort, including the UK reproducibility network itself. And to do all of those things in different sorts of ways, we need different kinds of insight into how, you know, how the take up and use of open research practices, which is you know, what we're aiming to improve, is actually being affected by the work that we're doing in the program. And so that's the sort of reason my rationale, if you like, why I'm interested in this. I think participating institutions may have other reasons. And you know, you may hear about some of those as we go through. But one of the things that we are trying to make a very clear distinction about is that we are interested in planning and evaluating support for open research. So that's why we want indicators that are anonymous and aggregate. We're not interested in this work in using indicators as a part of research or assessment. So that's a, a line that we'd like to keep, and it very much affects the ways in which we're, we're doing the work that we're doing. So insight. Um, this is sort of a top level um, summary of, of why uh, I want some insight into rigorous and transparent evidence of, of which researchers, universities, funders, uh, on which, sorry, uh, various stakeholders can plan. Um, and some of you will be familiar with the, the iNorm scope framework, which is a really useful framework for uh, planning the use of indicators. And we are embedding that within all of the work that we're describing here, both at the level of the program that I just described, but each participating institution is also using the iNorm scope to really reflect on why uh, they want to monitor particular aspects of open research and how they might go about doing that uh, and you know, the sorts of expertise and uh, engagement that might be involved in that. So you can see a, a, a few reflections there from me at the start about how, how I'm thinking about um, this from an open research program perspective. So 
we're doing quite a lot of work around sort of broadly speaking the insight part of the open research program and i'm going to focus we're focusing today on on indicators so broadly speaking the kinds of insights you might be able to get from systems tools and systems uh, wrapping those up perhaps with some some narrative as well uh, to make sure that they're properly contextualized but i this is one part of a larger strand of work within the open research program which includes surveys and other activities as well uh, but we are focusing today on on indicators so what's the aim why we're we doing this the overall aim for me is to establish good practice in institutional monitoring of open research and that might include the design of dashboards and reporting tools but it's very much to establish what good practice looks like and i'm going to say a little bit more about that because that that really affects how we're going about these pilots and what even we mean by a pilot. Work done so far, last year we spent uh, a lot of time scoping the work that we're doing. We had a, a webinar pretty much exactly a year ago today actually, or very close to being a year ago today. We put out a call for priorities asking the sector, what aspects of open research do you want to monitor? From that, we got together a group of institutions who are interested in participating in this work and prioritize from that that set of long list of priorities. Uh, we've worked across those group of institutions and we've also engaged with a range of, if you like, service providers, solution providers, third providers of third party services and data to, to establish, if you like, a consortium or an informal consortium in lots of ways of people who, who are interested in improving practice in this area and exploring what that means. So this year, we're designing and setting up this set of pilot projects uh, engaging with uh, solutions providers and others. So it's really important as a part of this work, and this webinar is a part of this engagement, to make sure that the lessons that we learn as we go through this pilot project, of these pilot projects, are shared as broadly as we can make them. Uh, we don't want particular institutions or particular solution providers to get exclusive benefits from being a part of this work. We want to share this as openly and widely as we can. If there's anything of value in the work that we do and what we produce, we want that to be of value to the widest possible range of, of stakeholders. So uh, we will be making efforts to do that. We're gonna put in place some quality control and evaluation uh, activities. Um, so as I said, Lydia is gonna talk a little bit more about some parts of that evaluation at the more strategic level at the end of this set of talks. Um, it's fair to say there's more work to be done around quality control and evaluation in the setting up of these pilots. So I won't be able to say too much about that. That's work to be done. And then next year, we're gonna roll this out. It's based on a set of participation principles. So this is the, what we've all agreed as, um, as institutions, as solutions providers to abide by. So this is the spirit in which we're entering into this set of pilots. And you can see uh, some really useful words there. So interoperability and, so, and solution neutrality, uh, transparency, inclusion and collaboration, uh, sharing access to data and to metadata and data portability. So the, these, I think, help us to have a, a shared understanding as we all go into these pilots um, knowing what our sort of expectations are and having having those shared um, and this was derived from from work that happened in the Netherlands and has been adapted from from that um, so what's the current situation we have eight pilots uh, well we may have seven pilots actually we, we're still talking about what how you count them and, and some of them may merge together um, they are focused on these topics, open and fair data. So the fairness of data, the openness of data, which are of course different things and the effects downstream of sharing data. Data availability statements, both the prevalence of those data availability statements and the, something about the quality and reliability of those statements. Uh, the prevalence of pre-registration and the use of the credit taxonomy. So it's overall use and how the credit records are being populated as, a, as one aspect of how author and contributor uh, contributions are recognized in, in the literature. So this is the group of institutions. Uh, uh, this may be a little out of date, but it's broadly right. I think a uh, group of institutions across the United Kingdom who are interested in this. You can see pretty broad range of institutions there, uh, which I'm delighted about. Uh, and several of those will be speaking fairly shortly as co-leads of these pilots. Each of the pilot projects has, has two, in, at least two institutions that are sort of co-leading it. So this is very much a sector-led um, initiative. And the solutions providers here, um, some of these uh, are um, need more discussions in order to make sure that they're engaging in, in the ways that we would hope. Um, but 
but uh, you'll see a list of familiar names there, some of which are sort of big open uh, initiatives, some of which are commercial providers, and some of which are mission-driven organizations. So really pleased to have that really broad range. And it's important that it is a broad range of participants, because as I say, what we're trying to do is establish good practice, and that needs to work in a whole range of different contexts. Otherwise, it's not good practice, frankly. Uh, so reflecting that, I'm just going to, uh, and this might be used to some of the pilots, to be honest. Um, this is the final report template. So that I wanted to set this out so that we know where we're heading. So we've got a shared destination for all of the pilots and we've got shared understanding of you know what, what it is that is of value that we're hoping to produce in the work that we're doing here. So that will comprise a couple of reports, if you like the final report. One is a report on indicators. And what I mean by an indicator here is a reasonably precise definition of the thing that's being counted, some guidance on what quantitative or qualitative evidence will be provided by the indicator. So what data, for example, is needed to produce the indicator and what processing steps will be done to those data in order to produce indicators. And some sense of what the narrative is that might surround any sort of indicators, especially any quantitative in indicators. So for example, how that indicator fits into the institutional context, because that will be really important. And what are the features of the sort of indicator? So what is the scope of application limitations, susceptibility to gaming, those sorts of things. So for each pilot, we're hoping that it's that kind of information that's going to come out. Um, and in order to evaluate that, uh, I'm going to have to do some work to check around things like the validity of the indicator, the reliability of it, how open and transparent is it, how feasible is it, both for the institutions, but also for the providers. And, and this is one of the things that Lydia is going to talk about later, sort of what is the interest of the institutions and of the providers in, in providing indicators of this character. So that's sort of our destination, where, what we're aiming for. Um, this has been evolving just even in the last week, so I'm sure it will change again, but I hope it gives you a flavor of the sorts of destination we're looking for. And that, I believe, is the end of my introduction. I'm happy to take a couple of questions before we leap into the first talk, which uh, will come from Pilot One and Kerry. But are there any questions at this point? I just wanted to ask one little follow-up. So you'd said that, um... Uh, you wanted to keep everything in aggregate and so that it wasn't to be used for, um, you know, research assessment in particular. But there's also this goal of embedding open research practices in things like promotion criteria and getting universities to to value them. Is do you just maybe you want to say something about how to square those two those two goals? Thanks. Well, I think they're separate goals, frankly. Uh, so I think the work that we're doing here is about how a program or how an institution will better support. Uh, open research, will it put in better training, will it put in better sort of tools and infrastructure, those sorts of things, and how will it know where to target that support? And I just think that's a different thing to assessing research, and it needs a different kind of indicator if it needs indicators at all. And so, yeah, we are working on uh, the kinds of things that um, might, institutions might do to change um, recruitment and promotion, but I just think we need to keep some fairly clear water between those two sets of things. Any other questions? Actually, yes, the slides will be, will they be provided? I'm sure they can be provided. Evgeny. Thanks. So I'm very interested in the, oh, I see the panel is not in the right place. I see that um, I would be very interested in the balance that you plan to strike between what's technically feasible and the, uh, the level of conceptual um, strictness or logic within the definition of the criteria because at this point of course there will be a big difference between what can be automated and what would ideally be the definition or operation operationalization of the criteria yeah no i think that's a that's a great question and certainly i would think that each of the pilots is going to have to do quite a lot of if you like discursive definitional work to work out exactly what it is that we want to count and then explore with the, the solutions providers and also the data from each institution to see what is feasible now. But what is feasible now shouldn't be what we're, you know, what's driving this. We, we want to be clear about what it is that we want to measure and monitor because we want to be clear about why we want that information and what that's going to inform. 
Otherwise, we're just going to fall foul of the spotlight effect and measure things that are easy to measure. And that we've done that too many times. There's going to be some compromising there, I've no doubt. But I think that's you know this is the right place to start. Nice. Just, Thanks. Um, I think each of the pilots is probably going to say something more specific than that. You know, that was a bit vague and hand wavy, but I think each of the pilots is probably going to put a bit more flesh on, on the bones of that. If they're conscious of, of time, we've got loads to pack in today. If there's no more questions at this point, I think I'm going to ask Kerry to talk a little bit about the first of the pilots. So, hello, I'm Kerry Miller and along with Jenny Adams from Sheffield and Gillian Curry from Edinburgh, like myself, we are co-leading pilot one, which is FAIR data, indicators for FAIR data. Now, superficially, that feels like it ought to be one of the simpler pilots. We all know what FAIR data is. I think most of us can probably recognize FAIR data when we see it, but actually turning that tacit knowledge into something that can be used consistently and recognized and valued across different institutions and in different contexts is actually far more difficult than it first appears. And one of the other things I'm going to see just now is the three of us who are co-leading this pilot are all brand new to working with UKRM projects. We haven't done anything like this before, so we're possibly being slightly slower off the mark than some of the other projects, as some of the other pilots. So we've got our first kickoff meeting on Friday and up till now, the three of us have just been working together, trying to establish what it is that we actually need to do in this pilot. And we think that one of the first steps is really going to be a review of the existing literature, because there is already quite a lot of work out there on what is a fair indicator? How do we measure the fairness of data? And there doesn't seem to be any point in us ignoring all of that and potentially reinventing the wheel and possibly a wheel that doesn't work. So I think that's going to be our first step will be the institutions, possibly without input from the providers, working through all of this existing literature and these existing, this existing guidance to see what has already happened and how much of that we can actually bring in and use without having to create our own new definitions once the participating institutions have come to some degree of agreement on what we think these indicators will be, that's probably when we're going to start working more closely with the individual providers. Most of the people in our pilot seem to be interested in working with open air plus data and plus data seer, uh, possibly core if they do join the programme. So I don't know if we will work with all six or seven of the providers that were on that list, or if we'll just narrow it down to a smaller group that the uh, institutions involved are interested in working with. So that is essentially where we are at the moment. I don't have a huge amount to say about our pilot at this stage, and that's why I don't have any slides. But I am happy to take any questions that people have at this time, and then I will be quiet and let you get back on schedule. Amazing. Thank, thank you, Kerry, and thanks very much for joining us when you're obviously not not necessarily on top top form health health wise, and I'm very sorry about that. Uh, any questions for Kerry, or, or indeed, given what you've heard, any pointers where you would think that, uh, that she might be looking, or she and her colleagues might be looking for that literature? There's clearly work that we know about in the European Open Science Cloud uh, and elsewhere. Robin. Hello. Uh, I'm here with a small group, if I can get my video going. Um, so we're. I'm just uh, here to learn. Uh, everything's very interesting, Carrie. I'm not going to try and put you on the spot, but I was wondering um, what you, like, I don't know many, how many indicators you're thinking about for FAIR, but the first one that comes to mind is, um, well, DOI is quite specific, so I would broaden that out to like a persistent ident. If the data set, if the data item has a persistent identifier, there's a lot sort of behind that in terms of proxies. Like it, it probably means it's, you know, in a repository. It's probably been reviewed in some way. It's it's probably 
shows that someone's curating it enough to have linkages to it. There's some investment, um, you know, in, in applying the identifier. So I'm wondering if you're thinking about any proxy type of indicators like that. Unless I'm way off base, which I might be. No, <laughs> persistent identifier is certainly top of our current draft list for the findable category. So when you look to see whether or not data is findable, whether or not it is cited with a DOI is quite a good indication of whether or not you can find that data, assuming people have kept it up to date and done it all properly. So that's that's all in there. And um, we have been already been looking at, well, I say we predominantly Jenny at this point has been looking at uh, different ones like the fair sphere object assessment metric object assessment metrics and things like that and we've got a few other ones that we already know about that we're bringing together we're going to try and synthesize all of these other ones to, to take as much as we can from the existing literature but um yeah and i see that yeah melissa's just made, made the very important point about accession numbers for things like omics data because a lot of those repositories have been in existence for a long time before persistent identifiers as such were a thing. And we do need to try and bring that in, otherwise we risk missing vast quantities of fair data just because they don't fit the current persistent identifier paradigm. And yeah, Lisa's there saying, yeah, sometimes with some providers, you can get a DOI for things which are not then locked and not kept in an actual repository, which can't be changed. So I don't know that we would use a persistent identifier as a proxy for any of the other elements of FAIR. It is simply, I think, about how findable a data set is. It's not, it doesn't tell you anything about the accessibility, interoperability or reproducibility of that the data in that item. Thank you. Evgeny? Um, I think it's more a comment than a question. I wonder whether the framework of indicators uh, at Wait, could all... Could you speak up, please? Uh, sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I, I'm wondering whether the framework of indicators uh, at all is really applicable here, because unlike for the others, I think that FAIR Fairness can actually be measured. I mean, at least for the metadata level, maybe not completely for the data level at this stage, but for metadata level, I would say that we can actually find out how it is. So we don't really need, I wouldn't call it an indicator. Um, that's, that's a general comment, I think. And generally, because all of these tools are already available, to me, this is really quite distinct from all the other um, parts or, or pilots um, for that reason. Yeah, I think this, to me, Personally, I say without the kickoff meeting tomorrow, this feels more like a pilot, which is going to be doing a lot of synthesizing of existing work, possibly rather than creation of new indicators or specification of new indicators. It's going to be about looking at the work everybody else has done and trying to bring that together to create something which is more universally applicable, shall we say? Because there are an awful lot of uh, these types of things that have already been attempted by other people. Loads of good stuff in the in the chat there. So thank you very much for that. We'll be capturing that and bringing that into the pilot. Great. Um, okay. Please do continue to throw things into the chat. Thanks very much, uh, Kerry, for introducing uh, the first of the pilots. Looking at fair data. Uh, I think we'll move on now and ask Kirsty uh, to talk about the pilot uh, about open data. Excellent. OK, so I'm Kirsty Murray. I'm research support librarian um, with a specific interest in research data management at the University of Bristol. Um, myself and my colleagues, Christopher Warren and Jade Godsall are running it from the Bristol end. And Chris Orr is also a project partner and a lead in Hull. So. I'll be frank, we've not got as far as we had hoped. <laughs> I think we're all slightly frazzled um, by the amount of work that is involved with all of the projects, all of the pilots. 
So I can tell you where we've got to now, and we have uh, we've got you know the documents are all set up so that we can see we've ticked our list to say which bit to see if we're on schedule. Um, we've con we've contacted institutions who had originally been in the kickoff meetings to confirm that their involvement is is still okay, and that they've still got the same solution providers that they wanted. Um, we've just uh, tied up the last couple of, of, of stragglers this morning to work out who was still going to be involved in this pilot. Um, we've created a list of those solution provider contacts because it's actually quite difficult to work from the original email lists that were provided, all of the, the meetings. So we've wanted to make sure that there was something where we've just got a single point of contact in one document to make it easier for everyone that's involved in the pilot. This just enables us to sort out communications between different institutions and between the pilot leads and the partners and solution providers. We've also created documentation, including a spreadsheet for those partner institutions and the preferred suppliers, um, just so that we know whether or not they are a full background, full partner or a background partner. Um, and also we've um, made sure that we've got the kind of terms of reference. So everything that we found from the original top level um, data uh, documentation and anything that was in the uh, pilot to itself, we've added into one document. So we've got the aims, the scope, all of the things that would be relevant to keeping us on track and making sure that we know exactly what it is that we're supposed to be aiming for. Um, we've also got our kickoff meeting tomorrow with all the partners, but not the solution providers. And that is very specifically because we want to give all of those partners an opportunity to essentially just what's and all say what their issues are, what the challenges are, um, how they feel about running the, the pilots, how what the capacity is for them to do things, just so that we can get all of that out there before the project partners, the part, sorry, before the solution providers come in, um, because that could change the nature of what people say if they know that the people they're then gonna be working with um, are in the room at the same time. So we will then um, have a later meeting with the solution providers and the partners once we've established the rest of the parts of the project. So the scope document, Bristol and Hull have put together a top level scope document. We have added details from other institutions um, who had written documents as a whole. So Glasgow and Surrey had put it all in one document. We've copied those across, um, but we do still require additional details in that document from the rest of the, the partners that are involved in this particular pilot. So at our kickoff meeting tomorrow, we want to agree the specifications. We just need to have a, you know, a full disclosure of what we think we can do, what kind of um, time we're looking at. So, you know, do we need to look at a specific duration, a period of time and see what was what we can establish was open data during that time? Um, we also want to see if people are drawing from a complete data on published data sets, whether it's in their repository or whether it's uh, they've taken details from their own um, institutional repositories and then have kind of trawled through those either manually or with some tool, magic tool that we might not know about. Um, to check and see how they're going to be um, reporting. So we just got, we want to make sure that we're all measuring the same thing, really. Um, and then we also want to know if people have only got capacity to do like a dipstick test of, of data that's available to them. Um, and also then we want to see if there's any pipelines or workflows that we can share and repurpose them across different institutions, systems and teams to see if there's anything that's been uh, drawn up by other people in the university, for example, at Bristol, we've got um, a project um, in life sciences where we've, we're collaborating with them to find out how they're looking at things like data access statements, openness and fairness of data and use of credit, because inside institutions, there's possibly work going on that might we could draw from. Um, and then for our next steps, we're going to complete drawing up the template contracts for providers and institutions. We hope to get that done by the end of next week. Uh, we're going to convene then a meeting with all the partners and relevant providers and then discuss with other pilots. Kerry, I'm really happy that you were kind of looking at, at the way that, that we're doing this across the board, because for some of it, I think that we might actually be pulling from the same data sets, in which case we could stop a duplication of effort if we're able to share that between the pilots. Um, and certainly for us, the, the ones that we would be looking at speaking with would be the, the now combined DAS project and carry um, your project on FAIR, because the baseline data is quite often going to be the same. And in many instances, you can't measure one of the pilots until you've got the same data that you have from another pilot. So that's kind of where we're at with it. Um, 
I've got, we'll be sharing the slides because you've got the embedded links in there. You've also got the contacts for the pilot leads. If you see anything that comes from the research data service at Bristol, that could be any one of us sending it out. Um, and then we've also got Chris or at Hull, who's the project lead in Hull. So that is it for me. Are there any questions? Um, there's one message from Alison Lister about using fair sharing to help with measures of openness. Yeah. Um, you seen that? Yeah, that was yes. me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you have any questions, I just I wanted to point out that we do um, have a registry of databases that includes repositories and knowledge bases and a thousand something of them, and they okay. have about ninety percent coverage on these metadata fields that I linked in the chat. The last ten percent are ongoing with the work from our volunteers and curators. So. Brilliant. Okay. Um, attributes of databases by querying the API. And okay, so that's great. Don't, I'm not sure how many of them align with what you're needing to do, but certainly some of them are relating to data access conditions, data deposition conditions, preservation policies, that kind of thing. Brilliant. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Kirsty. Um, if there's no questions, obviously we can come back if there are questions that occur to people later. I mean, I will take this opportunity uh, to just note we are, as you're beginning to pick up, a fairly early stage here, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to hold a public webinar now was precisely to get the sort of input that we're already getting uh, from today's webinar. So thank you very much for that. We will obviously as the pilots uh, mature and, and proceed we will be sharing more of the sort of outcomes from them but at the moment as you'll have spotted we're, we're in setup phase and, and listening phase so um, appreciate very much your input into this. Uh, the next uh, pilot is uh, being led by Etienne Roche and Alice Howarth so Etienne's at the University of Reading and Alice is at Liverpool and it's on the sort of downstream effects of sharing data. Now, unfortunately, neither Etienne nor Alice could be here today, so I'm afraid you'll have to put up with me, which is a very inadequate substitute, and I'm very unlikely to be able to answer any of the very good questions you're probably going to have. Um, but this is, uh, perhaps understandably, um, a more exploratory, perhaps, uh, pilot than some of the others. This is a slide from Etienne, which I'm sort of interpreting almost at the same time as you are. Um, the, so the, and that reflects the approach that, that they're going to take here. So by downstream reuse of research artifacts, data, code, and, and so on, we, we might be talking about sort of reuse downloads and, and secondary analysis. We might be talking about citations. We might be talking about the use of those data sets, for example, in uh, cases for promotion or for case, um, in um, in the use of policies, uh, for example, and policy development, if data sets or, or similar are used as evidence in that kind of context. There's a whole range, and, and you might imagine a whole range of different sorts of ways in which data research artifacts, open research artifacts, when they're shared, might have effects or impacts or, or downstream uses of, of all different sorts of kinds. And that's reflected uh, if you can see the some of the logos there at the top in some of the places that we might need to look for traces of those effects. So you can see thing, things like um, Crossref and really the Crossref event data um, data set is, is going to be relevant here. Overton, which is a database of policy. And so can we look for evidence in uh, there of the use of, of res open research in, in policy, for example. So there's going to be, I think, a fairly iterative process here whereby um, we explore what data we might have available, both from the institutions that are involved, but also from those uh, third party providers, not only the providers that are a sort of formal part of the pilot, but many, many others, especially ones that make their data openly available. We're going to be working from REF 2021 submission. So that's both impact case studies and the output submissions from 2021 as being a sort of common baseline and then looking at what downstream effects we can detect uh, from from those things so either things cited in impact case studies or, or 
or the outputs themselves as they're submitted to the ref or cited in as supporting material, for example, <clears throat> in those outputs. Um, so at the moment, as I say, institutions are consolidating a database and working with the providers to complement that to see what, what might be possible. And then with a, some iteration, this is going to be a fairly agile piece of work, we're going to aim to develop some sort of citation graph, some sort of graph of, of what the kinds of effects are based on the data sets that we have available. And then query what kinds of questions come back to the sort of the, the notion of what kinds of questions is it that we are interested in asking. So, you know, there, although there's a, a top level understanding of why we might be as a group of institutions interested in looking at the downstream effects, um, and we've sort of set those out through the, the use of the INOM scope framework, the specific questions that we might want to ask of the data will evolve through the way the pilot is being um, being run. So the expected output here is both um, a sense of what quantitative analysis might be possible, but also a qualitative narrative around that to contextualize it and to make sure that we understand what these uh, what these data are telling us, what these indicators are telling us. Um, so I'm going to stop showing that that is a about all I know of that pilot, as I say, you know, the, all these pilots are very much in setup phase. But I'd be interested in your <laughs> thoughts and questions on this, and especially if you've got any good ideas as to uh, how we might improve the ways in which we're going about looking at the effects, the downstream effects of, of open open research artifacts. Any any thoughts or questions? Uh, Cathal, yes, the slides will be uh, made available, provided the, the presenters are happy with us, and I suspect they all will be. Data, data citation corpus, yes, absolutely. Thank you for that, Evgeny. That's a really helpful pointer. Mark. Yeah, this is probably something that will come up in each of the pilots, but one of the, so it's really convenient to use the REF 2021 submissions as a starting point, and I can absolutely see massive benefits to doing that. I guess my concern with that is that, that those REF submissions are probably what a university considers its best outputs. Those best outputs probably have the most downstream impact, if you were going to guess. And so if we, uh, if we find that lots of uh, downstream impact from the openness of those outputs that might not mirror the downstream effects of the wider output of an institution that doesn't make it to a ref submission and so that's just something that, that that's a that's a decision that can be made and will need to be made for all the pilots but it is potentially something we need to be aware of if we're making that decision terrific point thank you mark and uh, yeah really well made um, that will have to be part of the the narrative that surrounds the sort of uh, the outcomes from this one. Any other questions at this point, or comments, or pointers, or advice on how we might do this better? Uh, Lizzie, yeah, well, point in the chat, which I'll just read out um, from, from Lizzie Gad, it might be misunderstanding the focus of this element. Sounds as though it proposes collecting data first and asking questions later. Is that the right way around? Um, it's, as I said, it's a more exploratory pilot, I think, than some of the others. And I think we are going to be upfront about that. There is an extent to which we are seeing what the data can tell us. But we are starting with this sort of scope analysis of you know, why is it that the institution is interested in an indicator in this area and what is it intending to do with the data or the indicators that, that arise from it. So at a high level, we do have, I think, the questions, but I think you know, it, it is going to be an iterative process and it's, you know, it's called a pilot because it's a pilot. We're, we're aiming to discover things here and if we can find out what the best way to to indicate the, the downstream effects of, of uh, sharing data and code, then that would be a step in the right direction. 
um, um, but it there's always the risk I think that uh, of the uh, street light effect where we're looking for what we have data on Uh, to this UKRN webinar on open research indicators. So we've heard a little bit about and had some discussion around uh, three of the pilots so far around fair data, open data, and the downstream effects of sharing data. And we're now going to move on uh, to uh, looking at data availability statements. Um, this was two pilots. I think it might now be one, but Lauren will tell us some more. So over to uh, Lauren Williamson from Leicester and Mick Eady from Glasgow. Hi everyone, so I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about our project. So I'm Mickey Day from the University of Glasgow, as Neil said. So I'm Head of Library Systems there, and I'm here with Lorraine Williamson, who's the Associate Director of Research at Leicester. And um, we're also working with colleagues, uh, Valerie McCutcheon and Radek Pajor um, from Leicester, um, kind of leading this project. Uh, so we're looking at the, the prevalence of data availab availability statements and also quality and reliability of those statements. Um, so it's ourselves in Leicester uh, who are leading the pilot. Uh, we're also working also with a range of other institutions in a wider group. So the universities of Surrey, Sheffield, Reading, Manchester, Leeds, Edinburgh, Bristol and Exeter. And we're also working with um, three solution providers. Uh, we're all helping to shape the pilot. Um, and he'll be providing tools and expertise and helping us to analyse some data. So the solution providers are PLOS, Dataseer, um, Elsevier and Digital Science. Um, and where we are now is we were very early stages, like a lot of the other pilots. We had our first kickoff meeting yesterday. Um, and then hot off the press, we've um, agreed to merge pilots four and five. So... It became very clear as we were sort of starting to develop our specification that they're so intertwined that it was you know a bit daft really to kind of keep them separate. Um, so that's what we agreed as a group yesterday to do. So it's now one pilot. Um, and the main work that we've done so far is to try and draft draft a specification, um, which we're currently refining and how we will define and categorize these data availability statements. And also slightly more than that, we hope the specification will help us to um, kind of publish how we sort of research methodology and design and what we're actually going to be doing in the pilot so that everyone can have a good look at that. Um, so as I said, we've currently been developing that with uh, the project leads and our um, solution providers. We're almost at the stage where we're going to be sending it around to our wider group of interested institutions. And once we've done that, then we'll obviously make it more public. Um, and the idea after that then, um, in terms of kind of general outline of the work, will be to collect some data and then obviously report back. Um, so as I said, we're still at a very early stage. Um, ourselves in Leicester have been meeting regularly. We've had a good couple of meetings as well with our solution providers. And as I mentioned already, we had our first kickoff meeting with the wider group. Um, so once we've kind of fine-tuned our spec, um, we'll then be in a position to kind of collect some data and move things forward. Um, I just wanted to kind of spend the last little bit of this kind of brief outline of what we're up to, to sort of look at maybe some challenges that we're sort of, or some of the things we've been discussing amongst ourselves, maybe for some comment and feedback. Um, so we're looking at defining the scope of um, what and how the data availability of statement uh, can be counted. Um, so looking at things like, is it just articles or are we looking more widely at conference proceedings or maybe even preprints? So looking at the output type of the underlying data that we'll be looking at. I'm thinking of categorization for the various types of um, statements that we come across for things like sensitive data, different means of access, um, no data, code and software, supplementary materials, all those sorts of things that we're going to have to try and drill into and unpick a little bit. Um, we're looking at defining and measuring um, the quality, obviously, of the data statements. Um, and part of that in the specification will be to um, set a defined list of kind of criteria that we're going to benchmark 
these statements against. Um, so we're in the process of doing that. And we're also probably going to be looking at um, how practice varies across discipline, um, which is another kind of way of kind of slicing the data, if you like, that we've been talking about. Um, and deciding what data sets to use. Um, so we kind of share, I mean, there's some of the earlier concerns around using the REF 2021 data. Um, I think for us, we would probably want to use something that's a bit more current because um, we think that probably practice has evolved um, certainly since 2021 and actually people including data statements and papers will probably want to analyse data that's a little bit more current than the REF data. And obviously we're cognizant that um, and there are lots of things that weren't included in REF that included data statements. So there'll be data, there'll be things we need to collect that aren't part of that data set. So really it's about choosing the data set. So that's what we're kind of thinking about now, the format that that might take. Um, where do we source it from? Um, is it a good idea to kind of start small, look at a couple of small data sets and then build it up? These will be things that we'll try and kind of um, specify up front in the spec so that we're kind of very clear about what we're going to be doing. Um, another kind of aspect of the data is when we're assessing the prevalence, um, then it's obviously going to be quite a quantitative exercise. Um, uh, you know, analysing sort of machine reading the full text might be adequate in those instances, but assessing the quality and reliability uh, will probably need us to drill down more into the statements themselves. So that might be a bit more manual. It might be a bit more qualitative narrative around that sort of work. So there'll be kind of two sides to what we're looking at. Um, and again, we're at a very early stage. So these are really just kind of posers that we're sort of thinking through just now as we sort of refine the specification. Um, so that's sort of where we're at. Um, and obviously we're here to take any questions if you have any today. David. Hi, yeah. Uh, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, w I mean, without wishing to prejudge uh, your findings, I mean, it may emerge, of course, that um, data availability statements are quite heterogeneous um, in their content and their format and even their findability. Um, so I just wondered what, I mean, is it part of the ambition to actually develop some guidelines about best practice um, as, an, as an output of this part of the project? Uh, yes, I would say is the answer to that. We did, we have touched on that as a group. And I think is where the idea would be to kind of categorize, um, explore and look at the quality, but hopefully as well on the back of that, be able to sort of come up with some fairly robust kind of recommendations that hopefully we could then would be quite a big or positive outcome of the project that could maybe be you know fed into the wider community. So yeah, that's definitely an outcome that would be very useful, I think. Yeah. Uh Lisa's put a, a useful comment in the chat there, uh Mick and Lauren, that she's done this with code for uh, APA. Uh so that that's something to follow up, perhaps. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, really useful. Anastasia? Yeah, thank you for your uh, introduction in this pilot. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but probably not. If there is any plan to collaborate with pilot one, openness of data, because for me, it sounds like if you already discover the state availability statements, you're already halfway to evaluate the openness. So whether it's two separate things or you somehow do the work together. Thank you. Yes, thanks for that. Yeah, we, de we definitely do want to obviously, um, you know, work with other pilots. There are crossovers, I think, mm -hmm. um, Neil mentioned at the beginning as well, with a lot of the pilots, so 100%. Um, you know, where there are clear kind of links. I mean, but I guess we want to, I mean, I know that um, Valerie has certainly been attending all the um, kickoff meetings for all the pilots. So I think she's trying to have an overview 
what everyone's doing and make sure we're not duplicating anything, making sure that making sure the work kind of dovetail quite nicely. So we're quite I'm aware of all that. And just a short comment, there are definitely some tools that do uh, both things simultaneously, like both data availability, availability statements and openness evaluations, uh, even maybe the data here if from plus. Yeah, so we're, um, yeah, so our solution providers are obviously working across the projects as well, so they'll give us a good steer. And, and obviously, it's probably well worth saying that um, each of our providers has different tools. Um, so it's quite interesting to see this sort of outcome and kind of different maybe results and and things that you get from the different um, bits of software and algorithms that they're all using. So again, that'll be quite useful to report back. So well, I guess one thing is that um, you know we're looking at this from an institutional perspective, but uh, journal publishers have certainly been looking at the ways in which the guidance they issue around data availability statements. Um, so that is another place to look. But then Lizzie's put a point in the chat, which I think is a good one. Does this tie us then to the journal article as being a unit of uh, analysis? Yeah, I, um, we did discuss this in the kickoff meeting yesterday that the kind of restricting and the scope and where we are in the publishing ecosystem and everything else. So I think it is something that we need to identify as a possible risk, really, within this pilot. If we are really looking at data that's underpinning, you know, a traditional research publication or conference proceeding. And we even had discussions yesterday about the complexity of preprints as well. But that's a really good um, comment. Thank you. We'll take that back to our um, pilot. Lots of really good comments in the chat there, which we'll we'll obviously we'll check uh, we'll collect and, and share with you, Mick and Lauren, so that you don't have to scribble them down now. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so thank you for those. One thing that I want I'm going to take chair's privilege, and one thing I wanted to ask you was we, we've we've talked about um, the institutions doing their sort of iNorm scope uh, analysis before this uh, this pilot gets going so that we have got a really clear, at least as, as clear an understanding as we can have of why institutions want to count these things and what they're going to do as a result of having indicators in, as this. Are you able to summarize sort of what what the institution's interests are in, in knowing more about the prevalence and population of data availability statements? Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, in the we had our first kickoff meeting yesterday, and um, that's one of the things we we've agreed to to revisit those. And actually, we haven't got a complete set, but Valerie and I are going to do some analysis to look at common themes across um, that documentation. So we don't have that at the moment. We have looked at a few and some of it very much is around um, institutional kind of where we are with um, open research, you know, looking at data as, as a valued research output. For others, it is, and we can't deny this, for others, it is requirements from the funders, you know, that there are funder requirements, but we're not quite sure what, what, what our authors or researchers are doing at the institutions. Um, so there's a variety of reasons. But once we do that analysis, we will make that available to people because there are there will be some common themes. There's no doubt about that. And I think it also depends on the maturity of open research practice as well within an institution. And that's one useful thing about this pilot is that we have institutions that definitely at different maturity levels with open research practice and particularly around um, research data. So that I think will be interesting um, for the folk as well. 
Yeah, thanks, Lauren. I, th I think that really will be interesting and, and important for us to share. Um, some really good points in the chat about the effect. I think we've summed it up nicely. We need to be mindful of the effects of if, of indicators. If we start counting something, then that, that something suddenly becomes a thing that can be counted and, and you know, we know where that can lead. Uh, so let's be across all of the pilots very, very mind, mindful of that. Any other questions or comments on, on the data availability statements work? Okay, please do continue to put stuff in the chat. As I say, everything is, is really useful. So um, whether it's uh, comments or suggestions of places to look or, or resources, um, it's all great stuff and will help these pilots do the best can, job they can. Can I just ask a quick question, Neil? Yeah, Nick, go uh, ahead. Um, just the, the question of code came up in the prelim. Do we decide yet whether or not code was part of this pilot or not? Mick, I don't know if you've thought about that much yet. Yeah, we're thinking um, in terms of categorizing somehow the sort of types, so code and software as opposed to data. And also um, our providers have been um, giving us some statistics already that a lot of data statements actually point to things like supplementary files already in papers and things like that. So we're going to try and unpick some of that. So um I think now, although this might change because it's quite early, I guess we're counting everything and trying to categorise it. We're not going to make a distinction be in terms of, you know, the overall count between code and data. That will just be counted as a DAS, but then we'll start to try and dig into it a little bit and categorise mm -hmm. the prevalence of each type. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, thank you, Lizzie. The, dec the Declaration on Open Research Information. I haven't. Oh, yes, when launched, not quite launched yet. Um, yes, um, absolutely. We need to practice what we preach. But to quote, and I'm not quite sure whether I am sure where this quote comes from, but I'm too embarrassed to say this is a journey, not an event, I guess, uh, the move towards more open research information. Um, let's move on. Uh, I think next we're going to hear from Mark and from Fred about uh, a pilot around pre-registration. So just to recap, this is, so first of all, it's really interesting. So I'm, I'm co-leading one of the pilots and I'm contributing to another four. It's really interesting how all the groups are self-organizing. It's the levels of, of organization are wildly different between the pilots. And it's, it's really fascinating to see how these herds of cats are all uh, self self-organizing. Um, our pilot is pilot six pre-registration from our document, from, from our stated mission statement. Um, how often does pre-registration happen? What are the patterns in that? And does that change over time? So we've been trying to keep ourselves fairly focused on, on literally that question, um, trying to evaluate how much pre-registration is happening in an institution. Um, and then we, we do want to have a look at patterns over time. I'll talk a bit more about that. We have this granularity as well that we want to uh, to try to 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 get to grips with. So once we've identified uh, levels of pre-registration, we want to be able to interrogate them um, with these additional um, components. It's co-led by me in Exeter and Fred in Manchester, but also we've got Leeds, Hull and Reading also involved. We have four solutions providers um, you can see digital science didn't get the memo about the color coding. Um, we've got, we're, we're in the process of, um, well, so there's a few things that we're doing. The first thing is that, you know, we're laser focused on remembering that this is a pilot. So, you know, um, in some senses, you know, the pilot mindset is failure is okay. You know, if we, if, if we can't do this and we demonstrate that it's not possible to do this, then that is a successful pilot outcome. Uh, I do think it's possible to do this, but it's just that that mindset. We're scoping possibility. We're documenting what you need to do and what you should not be doing. But it is not necessarily the case that we have to provide the entire solution for this. Um, and I think that's that's helpful um, way of, of setting this up. So we've been meeting for a month minus uh, two weeks, really, when, when there was a bit of leave uh, over half term. Um, so we have been we, we, meeting weekly and we've, we're setting up uh, meetings with these solution providers. And it's 
it's really interesting because we have these different levels of stakeholders and it's a really excellent example of co-creation and the difficulties that 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 makes i'm constantly trying to jump in with you know what what i think the best solution is and, and that really is not the way that it needs to work i, I really do need to hold myself back um and i, I think others are, are feeling the same way we want to make sure that what we're doing is properly and genuinely co-created. So we have uh, the, the two uh, lead institutions, and then we've got our wider pool of institutions. All of these must be consulted, and we have the solutions providers. And in fact, uh, some of the solutions providers are, are way ahead in their thinking than, than the few hours that we've spent um, thinking about these, these issues. So we have got one meeting set up with a solutions provider for next Friday, that's with open air. Um, POS data here seem to be quite far ahead in their thinking on this. And, and I, I'm my understanding is in March or April, they already will have some, some kind of um, outputs from a pilot on pre-registration themselves. So we're, we're keen to meet up with them, but we're keen to hear from, from everybody. Like Neil said at the start, this can't just be a solution for one institution or for one service provider. We are laser focused on, on, on keeping it focused. Um, and so, you know, in, in my head, I'd like the results section to be the number, uh, a prevalence. Um, and that, that, is a, that is a huge exaggeration. Um, Neil's, Neil's reminder about what the final report needs to look like was really helpful. There's other things that we need to, to, to consider, but I do want us to be able to say whether we can um, get a, a, a prevalence of pre-registration for an institution split by discipline. And, and that, that's one of the real key questions. How do we do that? How do we sample? Should we be stratifying by discipline? Do we stratify by department? What is the, the agreed way of splitting up disciplines? Because lots of people work on the boundaries of things. And so, um, you know, there's lots of approaches. We could try and look at all of the output of an institution. We could look at a ref return. We could look at each individual department and sample 100 papers. You know, there's lots of options here and we want to get buy-in from everybody about what the right way forward is. Um, there's different types of pre-registration and that is part of our, our question. So we do need to ask that question. Um, I think there will be uh, intricacies here. Like, I'm, you know, it probably doesn't make sense to be looking at clinical pre-registration -pre registries in a humanities department. M maybe, I mean, maybe I'm entirely wrong on that. Um, so, uh, but but I do think that, we, that there's lots of, of of things for us to to figure out here. And like Neil said, like a clear statement of definitions of what we mean, I think will be a a real output from this um this pilot. Okay, so that's where we've gotten to. Um, we're engaging with solutions providers next, and then we're going to bring everybody um along with us as we go. That's everything from us. Um, Fred, did you, did I miss anything? No, that was fantastic. <laughs> Amazing, Mark. Thank you, uh, and Fred. Um, thoughts about uh, indicators on pre-registration? Some great stuff in the chat already. Thank you for that, uh, Sue and Adam. Yes, I was. I was a lurker at that promises and pitfalls of pre-registration. I was online. It was. It was fascinating. There was lots of things there. Um, yes, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, registered reports funding partnership. Lovely. Yes. Love to chat about that. Yeah, I mean that's one of the one of the categories of pre-registration that we will want to be able to separate out. So, yeah. Can I um, put the same question to you that I put to Lauren and to Mick, which is, why are institutions wanting indicators of pre-registration? What are they going to do when they have these indicators? Yeah. So I've taken a sort of brief look through the no scope responses where they exist now. Um, I think. And they were fairly thin. There wasn't a huge amount of interest on this one. Um, so based mostly off our response and where, so where we're standing, we currently just don't know who is pre-registering across the university. And if we just get to a simple, we have a list of DOIs of people who've done it in the last year, that would be hugely helpful for some outreach in terms of that. Who are the advocates we can draw on for institutional response to try and increase the number of people who are engaging with this? Um, there's no sort of uh, extra steps beyond that, as far as I'm aware at the moment. Yeah, interesting. Thank you, Fred. I, I suspect that advocacy uh, point is is uh, 
is quite widespread. Any other thoughts for, for Mark or Fred on pre-registration? That's an interesting point on the data sites. I've, it's been a, a little while since I've gone through the data sites in my line by line, but I think that's correct. I think, yeah, that's almost like the core of the project is being able to link publications with pre-registrations, which currently isn't, even if it does get into these metadata schemas, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be applied by journals, et cetera, um, in a standardized way. So in a way, they're sort of looking at the same question, I think. And as part of the advocacy, just going back to that point, is that about raising a conversation across an institution about where and what type of pre-registration might suit different kinds of research? Are institutions looking to promote those sorts of conversations? We, we certainly are, yeah. Um, I think going back to the market points about keeping things focused, we don't want to get too deep into that um, so during the pilot, because as soon, like, even getting too deep into the question of defining what pre-registration is, because it's, I mean, more than just a sort of one line, not to minimize what it's like for a sort of a traffic statement, but it's, you know, quite a substantial document and defining what one is inevitably brings in questions about what a good one is. Um, so we're sort of getting out our 12 foot pole and trying to stay as far away from that as possible, but yeah, it will be sort of hopefully up to institutions once there is some sort of, or if there is some sort of indicator to then, yeah, know who's doing it and listen to those people about what they think about it. Yeah, no, thank you, Fred. Um, and no, it's not part of the, the pilot, but it, you know, it it's the, it's the reason that the back of your mind about why you're doing this piece of work, even though acting on that is not part of the work. Okay, uh, brilliant. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, Fred, for that. Um, the last pair of pilots that we're going to hear about then uh, are on the use of the credit taxonomy. Uh, and I'm grateful to turn now to Nick and to Nicola from Leeds to tell us a little bit about that one. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, just while I get these started. Um, so I'm open. I'm Nick Shepard, I'm a research advisor at the University of Leeds, and I'm joined by my colleague Nicola. Do you want to Say hello, Nicola. Hi, yeah. Um, so I'm Nicola Barnett. I'm Research Services Advisor at University of Leeds. Um, and just to sort of start with a bit of a disclaimer and a caveat insofar as I think others have referred to, you know, there's an awful lot going on and just trying to process all the information from the different um, pilots is no mean feat. Um, and I've actually spent a lot more time, thanks to Mark, in particular on the pre-reg side, because we've, uh, for example, in terms of the organisation there that... I think Mark's been largely responsible for. We've been having sort of weekly sprint meetings, so I'll be meeting with those again tomorrow morning. Less so with these particular pilots. And again, I think there's a question around how these are actually um, organised and if they are totally distinct. And um, I think there has been a kickoff um, meeting, hasn't there, Nicola? But I'm not sure that you or I even actually managed to attend that. So some of the colleagues that are involved in these from King's College um, for seven and Sussex and Newcastle for eight, I've only met through the medium of email, um, if at all. But they are the um, four institutions respectively involved in these two pilots. So I'll give you a brief overview of some of the thinking that's gone on very preliminarily. Um, and if we've got time, um, we thought it might be useful just for Nicola to say a bit more about the work that we've actually specifically done at Leeds, because we frankly know a bit more about that, and obviously in terms of our systems, et cetera, and how that relates to um, uh, perhaps some of the questions that, that we will be addressing. So question, um, the first part, seven, uh, the, the one that we are explicitly involved in is the overall use of the credit taxonomy. And the aim there is to develop valid, reliable and ethical indicators that provide data for how many publications affiliated to an institution have used credit taxonomy and across what disciplines. In that context, the unit analysis will be the output of the journal article. Um, now, I was just talking to uh, another colleague of ours, Sally, our line manager, uh, one of the uh, who's also involved in, these, in both of these pilots as well. Uh, and I wasn't sure to the extent to which we've actually consulted yet with the um, providers, but I noticed as I was speaking that, uh, is it Celine, C Serena Mitchell, who I'm not sure, from Kings, I'm not sure if she was on the call, she was actually adding to one of the um, Google Docs as we spoke about some of the stuff that's come out of the pilots, which I can actually read live, if you like, because some of it sounded quite interesting from the different suppliers. 
Um, but some of these were the basic questions we might be able to put into them, uh, you know, whether an output includes a statement of author contributions and whether we can have that in a binary, yes, no. And to what extent we can identify discipline in a standardised way, um, for example, based on the journal. I think there's been a lot of discussion around disciplinary standardisation across, across the pilots and year of publication. Um, these were some of the preliminary potential issues and considerations. So there may be issues with systems capabilities, of course, in terms of different university systems. That's perhaps something Nicola can talk about in a moment, as I say, if we've got time. Um, the extent to which they can share credit data, you know, whether that's publishers or institutional systems, we, for example, have symplectic elements and ePrints here, and including APIs and, for example, Crossref. There has been some discussion and movement from Crossref recently that you may have seen, but it looks like they will finally be getting around to putting credit in the um, Crossref uh, schema that may be available through the API. Some sub issues there, whether or not you know different systems might translate credit records in, in different ways. A list of authors, for example, um, it may surface issues about how credit data is captured and input. Who does that, especially across a large research collaboration? And it's likely to surface patterns for subsequent work, for example, in correlation with the use of uh, data access statements. And again, this goes back to the other discussions we've heard today around you know the crossovers between the different pilots. Pilot eight, I'm even less familiar with, to be perfectly honest, but the uh, this is how our credit records being populated. And the aim here, as I understand it, is to develop indicators to provide additional information about how it's being used, uh, such as the range of roles being used across different disciplines. For example, in that context, the unit analysis is the authorship statement. So, for example, who is represented in which credit fields and what might, might that depend on? Um, and we might want to better understand teams. So, for example, the technicians included um, and what about the roles of PGRs? But for example, this is a conversation Nicola and I were having earlier. Can we even identify PGRs? You know, that's not something in the credit statement itself. So there's other um, considerations there to say this is all very sort of preliminary, um, represents a stream of consciousness in some ways. Potential issues and considerations. Um, it could cover the frequency with which individual credit roles fields are used. Obviously, some will be presumably used more than others. I don't know them well enough to recite. Um, is it 16 offhand, offhand? I'm sure others know them better. Um, and what patterns uh, are people in the research community, obviously not just researchers, but technicians and uh, data stewards or whoever it may be, um, being included in particular credit roles? Um, and how do we actually identify individuals' roles? Um, you know, if someone's a data steward, for example, that's not necessarily captured in, in credit taxonomy. Um, whether people's credit roles vary in different credit records, um, the difference between credit records created in different ways. Again, these uh, I haven't necessarily thought these fully through, but journal submission or orchid data entry, for example, um, and patterns including change over time. So one of the questions that again, um, Nicola and I were just pondering this morning, you know, how can we tell which roles are even included in authorship at all? So, you know, can we identify colleagues, for example, in the research community that are not appropriately credited at all? So which is, you know, that's perhaps another question, not for this um pilot potentially. Uh, other potential issues and considerations, um, obviously a lot of uncertainty at this stage, as I think with many of the pilots, um, you know, the step, first step starts to explore patterns as a learning exercise. But use again, in terms of uh, targeting training, advocacy, as we've already touched upon, um, and awareness efforts to reduce unjustified exclusion um, of um, people that should be included in authorship and currently aren't. And there has been some research in this area. I can't claim to have read that, but that's on my very long reading list. So that's kind of a quick overview of the pilots. Um, so do we think, would it be useful, Neil, to have a bit for Nicholas to talk a little bit about what we know at Leeds? Yeah, I would, thank you. Okay, thanks. So um, at Leeds, I don't know, um, you know how prevalent this is at other institutions, but we have got um, credit written into our publications policy. So there's a line that says authors must specify authors contributions in all research outputs to ensure individuals roles are identifiable and duly recognized but is it you know it's a little bit tricky actually doing that um so we've got the credit taxonomy available in our Chris and symplectic elements but it's a very clunky process to add the roles manually um, and it's not the information isn't included in any of the feeds so as Nick mentioned before um it, there's a possibility that it's going to be coming through um via crossref at some point soon um but you know until really until it is included in the feed i can't see how we're going to really um 
constructively get the get the data into our systems. Um, but we got some stats um, a couple of days ago that showed engagement um, has actually been better than we anticipated. Um, and just to say it's not actually passed through, the information is not passed over to our ePrints repository yet, but that is something that we are considering. Um, next slide, please, Nick. So yeah, this is just um, uh, some screenshots of how it looks in Symplectic if you want to um, add your contribution. So for each author, you have to go in and choose the drop down and then click add selected role and if and then go on to the next role and for the next author, it's a very uh yeah, it's a very long process um to do that. And um when I was uh, I had to go at kind of manually adding one um for an uh, uh, for an article a few days ago and you know there were for I mean for you know there were probably like six authors with four or five roles each. Um and actually, there were it, it, the information was even more granular because for for each role, it it said um, what or so whether somebody um, was leading on that role or not, or whether they were an equal partner. So that was even more granular data than we were expecting to see. Um, next slide, please, Nick. So yeah, so this is a list of all the credit roles that have been added into um, our Chris already, which we were really quite surprised about. Um, so people are obviously taking notice of uh, our publications policy, which is good to see, um, and have been been adding those roles. Um, we obviously the information there isn't uh, isn't particularly granular. We don't know what year it is, and we don't know what um, what uh, what uh, subject area it is. But we could probably do a bit more drilling down into that um, if we had time and and uh, yeah, IT support. Um, next slide, please, Nick. Yeah, so just to say that we know that for Leeds, there are uh, about three and a half thousand publications per year that include the contributor roles. Um, and we got that information by going into Dimensions and using a really hideous search string that they provided for us, which was brilliant. Um, and uh, yeah, and that kind of gives us the, uh, yeah, what, what roles are present in, uh, in our publications. And you can see a uh, book publication which ones are included by year. So yeah, so that's just kind of how it looks at Leeds at the moment. And um, we had considered um, piloting manually adding uh, the data to our systems, but we've decided against that. As I say, uh, just, just, I was just gonna say Neil that um, literally just during this event, I think Serena's, it's Serena Mitchell has been adding a few bit of information from the various suppliers. So if people are interested, I can tell you a bit about that or share that in the chat. But otherwise, any quick questions? Lots of gen general commentary in the chat about indicators, and we can have a general conversation about their, their merits and risks, of course, uh, and how best to develop them in ways, if we need to, that promote positive change as opposed to discriminatory or other kinds of problematic change. Um, but anything specifically on Credit Robin? I'm just wondering, um, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but with the credit um, stuff, I remember being you know, very impressed in the beginning that this was going to count the type of researchers that um, don't end up being authors, but, but their careers do depend on, like other academics, on their, um, on their citation counts and things like that. But it seems to have gone to, um, the fullest extent possible, and there are some professions like um, like my team. We'd probably rather get a, a thank you in chocolates than mm -hmm. hear whether we're really you know put on the citation. So I just wonder if the, is there any point in putting a limit on it for the people whose careers do get judged based on their citations, as opposed to the rest of us who are just, as far as we're concerned, doing support. Well, I think that's an interesting question that I'm not sure I'd share that view necessarily. And I think that's a cultural aspect, isn't it, really? The fact that, you know, in, certainly at Leeds, we're trying to promote um, a co-creation uh, model and, a, and the fact that we are, you know, okay, we're not researchers and our careers don't depend on it, but we're trying to publish. We're talking about publication profiles for professional staff, aren't we, Nicola, and that kind of thing. So it is a cultural aspect that I think we're certainly trying to address and... Um, 
you know, if but you don't want to be credited and you're happy with a box of chocolates, that's fine. But I guess, you know, there, there is an argument for people, isn't there, wanting to be perhaps recognised for their professional expertise in a way that we currently not perhaps as data managers, for example, or whatever it may be. But yeah, interested in views. Thanks. Yeah, it's good to hear, Matt, Michael. I think hopefully soon. I mean, that was it was only last week, wasn't it, Nicola? That that was a thread you started on Crossref, and we've been asking them for for years. I know Valerie McCutcheon, your colleague, Michael, has been asking as well. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting point, and I, I guess one of the, I hope one of the good outcomes from the work that we've been describing today is that you know we've got researchers involved in this, we've got professional staff involved in this, and if we can kind of find ways to erode that boundary a little bit in constructive ways. I don't think that would be a, a bad thing if we can bring the best of research and the best of professional practice to the sorts of pilots we're talking about here. That's got to be a good thing. And there is quite a lot of discussion around that, isn't there? This term research adjacent I've heard uh, recently and, you know, trying to to think that we're, we're not just support. We do actually have valid expertise that can add to the research process and that kind of thing. You've been in a podcast about that, haven't you, Nick? Yes, I wasn't going to plug that, but thank you. <laughs> but yeah, we would still appreciate chocolate if it's available. Um, okay, any other thoughts? Anybody who's been putting things into the chat wants to bring them into this conversation? If not, thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you, Nick. For that, uh, so that is the end of the conversation or the, the end of the presentations around the specific pilots. But uh, I'm really pleased now to be able to introduce Lydia Wheeler from University of Bristol. She's a master's student here, and she's doing a piece of work again, early stages, um, on you know what uh, what are the characteristics, I guess, of the sorts of indicators we might want, should we want indicators at all, uh, to to have available to us. Lydia, do you want to say a little bit about the work that you're you're kicking off? Sure thing. I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Yeah. Um. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just want to start off by saying thank you so much for having me. It's been really interesting to listen to what everyone's had to say as well. And I feel like I've actually learned a lot um, by having your rundown on what you're up to. Um, so yeah, if you haven't met me before, I'm Lydia, I'm a master's student, um, and I'm working on a project which is titled Investigating the Priorities and Responsibilities um, of producers and users of open research indicators and Neil is my supervisor so Neil if you think that I might have forgotten something or have misspoken please feel free to jump in um, but yeah so as you know this is a project that works very much hand in hand with the pilots which are going on at the moment um, and it's essentially a mini protocol that I'll be giving you today um, and I'm certain you're all more than aware of the background of a study that is like mine but I'll give you a little baseline rundown regardless um, so my project is more so to look at the interests and responsibilities of those who are using and producing the current research, uh, open research indicators. Um, as we know, indicators of, re of open research can be an effective way of providing information on the uptake of, of, of open research practices and collecting and analysing this data on the usage and impact of these indicators can be used to develop more effective indicators. Uh, I'm hoping that work like mine will contribute towards creating some definitive guidelines by which people can produce research that adheres to a certain standard um, or used by funders, institutions um, to inform their practices as well. Um, there have been previous discussions concerning the creation and production of these indicators. For example, um, the metric tide suggesting uh, a need for greater transparency and openness in research data infrastructure and also uh, that a set of principles should be developed to support open and trustworthy information management alongside uh, the seven guiding principles for open research information proposing collaborative work between users of open research indicators and solutions providers too. Um, and with another headline finding of the metric tide being that there are growing pressures within the research community to perform to prescribe standards um, alongside other work suggesting that there's pressure and emphasis on creating and using poorly designed indicators. It lends itself to asking who are making these indicators, why are they doing it the way they are, and what are their interests and responsibilities. Um, and I think looking at this can give us an insight into the possibility of improving the culture around open research and therefore the quality of the research produced. 
Um, so yeah, the primary aim of this study is to assess the prospects for better indicators of research. Um, and to do this, I'll be looking at the interests and requirements of the users um, and producers of open research indicators. Um, for the users in the study, we'll be looking at research institutions and to what extent the current indicators provided by producers of these indicators um, meet the characteristic requirements. So there's no current reason to assume that the requirements of the users match the characteristics of the existing indicators provided by producers. And um, even if they did, it's it's an open question whether to whether this would be applicable in the future. And it's known that capability, opportunity and motivation all lead to an effective change in behaviour. So understanding the interests and capabilities of producers of these indicators is a really important insight um, into potential evolution for indicators. So therefore, there are three primary research questions, which are firstly to investigate which open research indicators users believe are most useful for them in the pursuit of research excellence and impact. Secondly, um, investigating to what extent the current research indicators provided by producers meet those uh, requirements of the users. And then finally, to look at the interest and the capability of the producers to develop and produce open research indicators in a collaborative way that meets the requirements of the users. Um, so how are we doing it? This is all starting with recruiting the two participant groups I'm interested in, so the users and the producers. Group A is the representatives of users of open research indicators. So in the study, it would be those responsible for institutional policies or overseeing open research practices in institutions, for example. And then, yeah, the representatives of the producers um, of open research indicators. Um, as for how we'd be collecting the data, we would be, well, firstly, a focus group with the users. So the aim of the focus group is to look at the institutional outlook on open research and its contribution to research excellence and impact, but ultimately come up with a set of characteristic requirements um, for indicators as a product, for example, whether they're valid, transparent, cheap, reproducible, understandable, so on. And uh, after this, well, this will be used to inform a survey. Um, so yeah, a survey with the same inclusion criteria um, will be informed by this to send out um, and that will be used to validate the outcomes of the focus group. Um, and this will be sent to as many people think in the inclusion criteria for group A. Uh, so that would be the expert representatives of these organizations. Um, to find the participants for this, by the way, we used stratified sampling based off the peer groups from the track benchmarking data. So I essentially used available titles from uh, to find participants from three groups, and we split that by academic leads, professional leads, and library service uh, library or services leads from um, institutions um, at all track levels as well to get a representative sample of um, research intensive and less research intensive universities and get different points of view from different roles. Um, after this, an interview, one-on-one -on -one interviews with producers will take place um, with folks on understanding their interests and capabilities as well. Um, and we'll be using the outcomes of the survey in the focus group to inform those questions, asking their understanding, opinions, um, how feasible it would be to respond to certain characteristics and whether they'd be well-placed to do it. And uh, like Neil said earlier, it's, this is a really important part of the research that gives us good insight onto the, uh, as to the capability of the provider um, in sustaining these indicators. Um, so yeah, where are we up to now? As of last week, uh, a focus group has taken place. So this is very exciting. Um, and moving forward, the information gained from this will be analyzed and used to inform the survey, as I just, as I mentioned. Um, as for what the, outcome of the research is or what I think it will be. I'm still a few few months away from being able to give a concrete answer, especially as someone who's quite new coming to this, but I'm really interested to see how it goes. Um, and what what can come from this research is obviously the strategic, the, the long-term side of the pilot. Um, and, it, and hopefully it will uh, inform future creation of these co-designed indicators. Um, and I think it could also be a good springboard for research on accountability in this area as well um so yeah that's everything from me apology about the lack of slides um but yeah i'm really open to any 
thoughts or feedback this is my first piece of research so really interested in that and thank you so much for listening amazing thank you lydia um yeah it's really interesting and exciting piece of work so thank you for presenting on it any questions or uh suggestions for lydia or pointers that she might want to think about in the work that she's doing any thoughts on it so i guess the point out the timeline i think you're working on it until about it's about september october time i think is that right lydia that's right yeah yeah okay well if anything occurs to anyone you know where we are and i think it's a really interesting piece of work and i'm hoping that um it will complement uh the work that's going on in the pilots kirsty Sorry, it's taken me that long to find where Ray's hand was on the screen. Um, having taken part in some of those initial kind of dummy runs of the questions that Lydia was um, asking, it was a really, really, uh, not only fruitful conversation, I hope, for Lydia, but kind of inspiring. It was a really good thing to do on a Friday afternoon because I felt all reinvigorated about how marvellous open research was. So if you do get an opportunity to do this, please do take part in it because it was um, really quite illuminating about the, the way and the passion that we have for the things that we're doing. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you. Uh, Tamsin's asked if you could uh, put your research questions in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, that would be... Of really course. Good. I'll pop them in now. Thank you. And thanks, Lizzie. Okay, I think we're probably drawing to a close. It's uh, it's we're nearly at the two hour mark, so it's been a fairly long and intensive uh, webinar with quite a lot of material. As you can tell, the pilots and indeed Lydia's work are all at a fairly early stage. We um, commit, I think, all of us to come back and and make uh, make opportunities for a whole range of people to uh, engage with us carry on uh, advising us as the way that you've done so constructively today so thank you very much for that um, and uh, yeah we'll we'll be in touch in various sorts of ways to keep you up to date with with what we're doing uh, but in, in the meantime have a, a very good rest of your Thursday afternoon